Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, as I was saying, uh, we're really, really pleased um, that you're joining us for this sustainable design talk. Uh, I'm Eli Zawi. I run the Smart Sense program, uh, which is part of the ME Flower Project and based at Fab Lab Plymouth at Plymouth College of Arts. Um, today, I'll be facilitating this talk. And um, <clears throat> In addition to the uh, workshops and training that we deliver in uh, digital design and digital fabrication, we also have a sustainable design initiative. And as part of that, uh, we're delivering a series of talks um, showcasing sustainable and innovative uh, design and manufacturing practices uh, by businesses, makers, artists. Um, so this is actually our third uh, sustainable design talk. Uh, earlier this year, we have been focusing on uh, things like making objects um, following circular economy principles. And uh, we also heard from the WASP uh, company uh, based in Italy, who are uh, 3D printing eco homes uh, using local clay. And um, tonight, I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by our speaker, Ian Hanke. And so Ian is a talented glassblower and also uh, the principal technician at Fab Lab Plymouth. Um, and Ian's recently launched his uh, community interest company called the Upcycle Glass Project. Uh, it's a very exciting initiative. It's happening locally uh, here in South Devon and it's tackling glass waste. Um, so the format for this talk is uh, split between two parts. Uh, so Ian will be telling us about what the problem is when it comes to glass waste and uh, the solution provided by the Upcycle Glass Project. Um, then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A session uh, followed by a five minute break. And then we'll come back in the space uh, for the second part of the talk, uh, where Ian's going to tell us a bit more about his background and his vision for uh, sustainable businesses and resilient communities. Um, and finally, we'll sort of answer any additional questions you may have and, and wrap up the, the event. So uh, without further ado, I will um, leave Ian to sort of jump in and uh, share uh, his screen as well. Uh, welcome to Fab Lab Plymouth and um, uh, and this presentation. Um, I'm just going to whiz through uh, some of the difficulties. Um, I think many of our students don't know that actually I used to be a glassblower. You're always a glassblower. You, you don't stop being a glassblower, really. Um, and this is actually Sidi Langley's workshop in Columpton. I'm sure she won't mind me showing this. Um, it's a standard kind of setup that many of us will recognize. We've got furnace. We've got a glory hole or two, depending on the size of our workshops. And we have two blue kilns on the other side there. And so we gather the glass, for those of you who don't, uh, who don't work with glass, we gather it out of the furnace, we work it, and it goes cold, so we have to put it in the glory hole. And it's all very, very expensive. And, uh, and that kind of kit is, is getting harder to run, obviously with gas prices going up and so on. So that's our standard kind of setup. Also, um, we have a difficulty with a lot of our, when, when we put colouring on that, in that um, furnace, for instance, it's just clear glass. So we put colouring on our glass, which of course we need to. Um, we can't really recycle it easy, easily. So this is our general kind of throw out at Team Valley Glass. I say our, I used to run, I was a manager from 2002, I think, to 2000, for about four years anyway, but I'm still kind of closely linked with them. Uh, so that's the kind of waste that we're sending out to landfill uh, quite regularly. And of course, now TVG are buying Cullet. Uh, it's being bought in from Europe, and it's cost them between £2,600 and £2,800 a tonne for this very expensive glass. And of course, we have a major problem, uh, not just kind of locally, but globally, with huge mountains of end of life building glass. Now that's not to be confused with bottle glass, which around about 60 to 70% of that is recycled in this country and in Europe as well. But we don't recycle end of life building glass, which is kind of windows, that kind of thing, um, back into glass products. The only thing people are doing is crushing it up and putting it into concrete and that kind of thing. So we do have these real problems of um, 
uh, of I'm just going to set my timer. I've just realized I haven't done that. Um, there we go. This will get sort of some idea. Um, real problems with um, these are actually toxic. I think there are chemical kind of reactions taking place at the heart of these things. And uh, it's a real problem of what to do with this. Um, and I think there are some initiatives, both in the UK and EU, to try and look at that. And when you consider, when I was a student, a bright-eyed student at the Royal College of Art, we used to get the most amazing people coming to visit. And one of those very influential people was Dan Klein. We're really looking forward to hearing what he had to say. And he came in and he told us that it's no longer financially viable for a glassmaking graduate to set up a workshop because it's too expensive. And that's back in 1995. Uh, so you can imagine that everybody who works in glass now should be congratulated because you're working against such a kind of amount of difficulties when it comes to gas prices, when it comes to colour and batch and so on. Um, I remember when the batch, I'm so old now, I remember when the batch was about 800 quid and I thought that was terrible. You know? So we have got some difficulties there. And one thing I do want to say before I start is that be very, very careful. I mean, I, I've been working on glass melts and I'm very crude the way that I go about it but I do know a little bit about the chemistry as well. And just going from one glass to another can destroy a furnace. So for instance, all those people who was working with lead glass and they decided to go to leadless um, and then realized, hang on a minute, the inside of my furnace has turned to mud and it will do that over just a couple of months. It's because you've got an alkaline and a non-alkaline glass within that chemical reactor and you can do a great deal of damage if you're not careful. So just a bit of a word of warning on that. So we've got financial problems and right now, ever increasing gas prices, we are talking uh, uh, Murano are running from methane. I think they have to run by methane by law, actually. And the price of that methane is rocketing to the point where it's actually gotten wondering whether they can continue, whether it's financially viable to continue. Our materials, as we mentioned, are, are going up and up until you know we're actually paying between, I'd say about 1,500 for a cheaper batch to 2,800 for the best quality colour. And then we've got this huge competition that we've had since the late 80s, early 90s from Chinese imports. I remember when we didn't have that. <laughs> it was so much more fun. And furnaces, of course, need to be on all the time. You take your furnace up and it tends to stay up. Um, uh, it'll stay up all year and then we'll bring it down and change the pot over summer. And then we'll take the furnace back up again. Of course, it's, it's costing us money while it's doing that. And it takes a long time to take your furnace up to temperature as well. It's quite a heavy, thick pot, so we can't just send it straight up and bring it straight down um, on a larger type furnace. I know Mini Melts have got a fantastic product, though. We'll go into that bit later, perhaps. Um, so we've got environmental problems as well. So uh, a very large amount of our waste glass, as we saw from the TVG stuff, goes straight to landfill. And there are some wonderful people, City included, actually, who are using that to cast into um, a product. And as well, I think the Glass Hub are doing some wonderful work with that as well, but it's small amounts. Um, uh, and I want to actually get that back into use. Um, there are mountains of end of life building glass, as we mentioned, which isn't being recycled into new glass products because um, the large factories, they don't want to put any, any old rubbish into their uh, mill because it's seen as a contaminant uh, for the perfect quality glass that they need to come out the other end. This next line here, if we melt raw materials for every three tons of window glass we create, we produce two tons of CO2. Put a little star on there just to uh, just to remind myself that I got that off Wikipedia. So I can't say that that's absolutely true. Or if it is, that's frightening. I worked at Pilkerton Glass for quite a few years. And to think the amount of CO2 we pushed into the atmosphere during them is actually quite a shock. Um, and glass studios buy the material in tons, and that should be T-O-N-N-E-S, a metric ton, uh, from the EU, to EU, which of course then creates emissions traveling, actually getting it to the country with freight. And then we've got technical problems, as we mentioned, that we can actually, when we try to milk different glasses, we can inadvertently create the most incredibly corrosive materials that would destroy crucibles, factory furnace reserve surfaces, and then your, then your curtains or whatever, it'll, it'll go up. Uh, so what we need are some solutions and 
Uh, we do need to move to renewable or reusable energy and find a way to make things cheaper. And there's some fantastic work going on. Uh, there are a lot of electric furnaces out there. Um, there are, I think there's a hydrogen furnace. Hydrogen fuel cells um, would be quite an interesting um, thing. Um, and I'm looking at methane as well, um, which of course is not new. Methane has been around for donkey's years. I think in Liverpool, some of the uh, larger buildings were running off methane in the 1950s uh, because they couldn't afford town gas. So um, I'm going on a little bit here. So we're going to try to reuse already formed glass material. If, it, if we're throwing out three tons of CO2 when we melt from raw materials, then we've got to try and find a way of melting the glass that's already formed. That's not going to take as much CO2, or push out as much CO2, I'd say, uh, to reduce costs and emissions. Uh, design and develop CO2 recapture systems, I put that to furnaces. I'm already working um, to provide technical support in my role in the Fab Lab to a brewery, and we're designing and making a CO2 recapture system. And the idea is that CO2 we recapture, we clean and filter, and it goes back into the brewery to, um, to carbonate the beer, basically. And so it's a useful thing that we can use with it. Um, we got that and bring down the cost of building and running glass making equipment to allow competition with cheaper imports are written there. Um, so we do need to actually build our own kit and think about cheaper ways of doing that. And I've just put here, build a furnace can simply switch it off at the end of the day without damage to the crucible in the furnace. So just turn it off when you're not using it. But I'd also like to have about 50 kilos of output per day. So that means we're going to get the amount of glass, which is quite difficult to do as well and be able to reach working temperature in two hours from cold, just as um, Katie Young's fa fantastic uh, mini melts do. Um, and now we've got new methods, process and technologies developed through innovation and research. That's where we're going to find these solutions, I think. So uh, around about, I think it was 2011, I built this, and some of you might recognize Bob. Uh, which went to the International Glass Fed Festival, and we had to build this thing with no tools. Um, and that was quite a, quite a difficult thing to do, actually. There were one or two little problems because it, it costs so much money because the, the pot slipped and all sorts of problems with, with uh, initial kind of gas use. But once it's settled, um, it's very, very cost effective. And um, the glory hole on the side there is running about... 100 to 200 degrees higher than the furnace, but it's not a standalone unit like you saw in the first slide. It's actually um, just tacked on like a Bunsen burner. When you open up the, gl the glory hole um, cover, the front, the furnace goes up between 20 and 40 degrees. And, and that's because air is sucked inside, down into the uh, furnace itself, and makes the furnace more efficient through that extra um, oxygen. In the mix so instead of my glory hole being a standalone which is actually the main cost of running the glass furnace when that's on um it's actually saving me money um, and I'm, i've actually got a twin pot version as well so we can get 225 kilo pots in there the interesting thing about this furnace is that the combustion chamber is completely sealed from the central part where the glass is so i can extract the uh if i run on methane for instance I can extract the CO2 once that's burned, and the only emission I'll get is water, I hope. So that was run for a year over at um, uh, Dartington Cider Press. Just going to check my time. We're all right here. And it worked out. I've got the figures for the gas. I think it came out about between £15 a day if it was just on for one day, or if it was running overnight, it was about £25 a day. It came to a maximum of £2,500 that I spent in a year running it four days a week. It was actually three working days, but I lit it the day before so I get good quality glass. And there is the building that I put together. Um, and of course, I don't need an extraction system because I very crudely just have a sloping roof. And you can see the furnace is inside that shed, the better enclosed part, but again, it's got a sloping roof and I've made sure I've got a grill so that automatically hotter rises and goes straight out. So I don't need the expense of that. And uh, as I put down there, it ran for 12 months in 2012. Um, and since I've been working in the Fab Lab, which is over the last uh, seven years or so, was it eight years? I can't remember now. 
uh, basically, uh, we're, we're really lucky in the Fab Lab that we can actually support and provide technical support to some fantastic projects. Uh, Art and Energy was one of them. I was working with them, and I'm also providing technical support for um, Exeter University. Uh, actually, Katie uh, Shanks at Exeter University, um, and we're designing um, solar concentrators, which essentially just magnifying glasses uh, or mag yeah magnifiers that go over very small solar cell so instead of a solar panel the solar cells this big they're actually quite tiny but very very efficient and um, below you see um we actually glass blow in and creating a part for the co2 recapture system that i'm working with the brewery i'm sure tim who's developing this won't mind me showing this bit it's uh you can't really see what what it's for or anything but i used cad to make the components but i used um traditional glass blowing uh, methods to make that actual object. Now, that doesn't seem particularly sustainable, perhaps, because you might be able to buy one of these for 15 pounds, but it'll come from China. And my vision is that we can actually make things within our local community. And I'll go into this in the, um, the second part of the talk. So here we have using CAD to make the, to design it, but using methods very similar to what Romans were doing 2000 years ago to be able to make it. And there's a bit, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna read this out. It's, it's very bad of me, I know, but earlier this year, glass bone was added to the critically endangered category of the Her uh, Heritage Crafts Association. And now I already knew that there was a problem in terms of uh, trying to get our graduates to set up their own businesses, but the cost of it, but it is actually getting worse and worse. Uh, particularly with the recent rise in, in gas, of course. So that hastens the need to do something about it. Uh, and what we need to do is not just look for a cheaper furnace. We need to find an alternative financially, environmentally, sustainable alternative business model. We need to completely rethink how we do business to be able to continue. Um, and actually the company that I've set up with Companies House is actually set up, but I don't intend to start trading until the 1st of January, so that we're in uh, the first day of the UN International Year of Glass. I think that's quite apt. And this is my team, where I'm very grateful for. There's some fabulous people here. Um, as myself as director, but also what I've done is I've asked these people to join me. I hope they'll become directors as the company grows, but at the moment, they're a steering committee. So we've got Richard Glass, um, many of you may know he's an award-winning designer, but he also runs Team Valley Glass Studios. And I'm hoping to take his waste glass, refine it, and give it them back in really spectacularly worthwhile or what's a useful kind of uh, um, state. And then we've got Andrew uh, Bradford, who owns Brint's Farm. And the reason I'm on the farm, of course, is because I can harvest all the materials I need um, to lower the temperature of that end of life building glass and I can change its chemical state with natural um, uh, uh, ash from plants, uh, in, this, in this case, fern. Um, and then we've got Jamie Kay, who has actually um, developed and built the website that we're gonna go on to in a few minutes. So the four of us have actually started this project, but we have another three people who haven't done anything yet, but we're gonna be vital to it. And Dr. Katie Shanks, is actually developing those optics I was mentioning. Uh, so we are actually going to develop those concentrator um, as a product, but I wanna design the product and I also wanna design the glass that is the product is made from. I also want to design what's gonna to happen to that product at the end of its life. And then we come to Sarah Fern, Dr. Sarah Fern, who is essential to this. I worked with Sarah uh, over 20 years ago, uh, as uh, Victoria as well at, at, at the V&A. Um, trying to find a solution for glass disease. Um, and we found it. The Imperial College material scientists couldn't melt this glass. It was too corrosive, so they came to me. I was working at the RC, at, at RCA at the time. Uh, I found a way of melting it, and we blew plates, and we found a way of actually, um, uh, or rather Sarah found a way of arresting glass disease along with the uh, people at the V&A. Um, and that, that was quite a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and Victoria, of course, um, is, uh, or has recently um, been head of 
object conservation at the V&A. And it's really important that these three people are with me on this project because I need to have um, art, design, craft, science, and history, um, and expertise in all of this, all this area, to be able to achieve what I want to when it comes to the business model. And uh, this is just a quick, really rough drawing. Um, if I want to run my furnace on methane, the main cost is actually transporting methane. Methane, it just comes from, from cows, basically, or cow slurry or whatever, or a dump. If you cap it, you can actually extract the methane from it. But if you want to transport it from one place to another, it's cryogenic. You need to go down to minus 264 degrees, I think it is. It's definitely more than minus 250 anyway. That's costly to actually get right down to that temperature. And it's also dangerous when you're transporting it because any kind of environment around it will cause it to slightly warm and then they have to actually vent it. And you're venting a very explosive gas. So it's moving the methane, which is actually the really costly thing. So my thought is, well, let's just whack the furnace on the farm. There's no need to actually convert it into a liquid. We could just pipe it straight in. Um, so that's why one of the reasons why I'm on the farm. The second reason, of course, is I can harvest fern. And I've done some research. Um, so I've done some research. A lot of people have done research into the way that um, fern was used both in Italy and in the UK uh, back in the 1700s and earlier um, to produce the, um, the flux to lower the temperature of a glass mixed with sand. So the fern is, is why I want to be on a farm on Dartmoor, because obviously we're in Devon and we're surrounded by fern. Um, but we have to pick it at a certain time. And Andrew is uh, absolutely brilliant. He's actually gone out with me in a tractor and we've harvested a load of fern ready to, uh, ready to go. Um, and then around that farm, there are small businesses. There's the brewery I mentioned, because I actually any kind of methane any kind of CO2 that I capture from the methane, which goes through filters and so on, I can probably take to the brewery, but he's actually probably making his own as well. Any surplus will go to other businesses in our region. Um, not too far, because we don't want to have too many emissions going up and down the country. Um, but there's basically a free kind of uh, um, resource there. And as long as we're not looking to, to make maximum profits, as long as we're looking to use it, we want to put the environment first, then once all these businesses realize, hang on a minute, I'm really benefiting from this, then we can start to get a proper circular economy. Um, I'm hoping that Andrew will generate interest because he'll have a working glassworks, which will attract visitors to his farm, which is diversifying. So he's got um, uh, accommodation there and all sorts. So um, the farm will benefit from the glassworks being there. I'll benefit because obviously I'm getting free glass basically, both from end of life building glass at the top there and the SME glass studio, which in this case is Team Valley Glass. They're gonna be sending me all their waste. And in return, I'll send them some perfectly refined, clear waste glass back. Um, but I'll have some glass to play with in the meantime. Uh, similar, there's a local glazier that's asked if they could send me their off cuts and not send it to the uh, the tip because it costs them money to send it to the tip. I've also got two pubs that have already kind of been in touch wanting to give me all their waste, uh, clear glass, um, uh, clear glasses and a bottle glass as well. So that's kind of, you can see this, this kind of idea of, of putting this together as local businesses working together. But what I want to do then is put lots of uh, small furnaces around Dartmoor. Uh, Andrew Bradford, the, the farmer, is, is actually um, on Brint's farm, but he's also part of the Dartmoor Farmers Association with links to almost 200, I think, farms across Dartmoor. So we could actually scale this up, not just here, but every kind of place up and down the country um, that is near and more. And then we can look at other plant ashes as well. We've recently melted a glass just with seaweed and sand. So anywhere near the sea, you can use seaweed. But of course, we're going to harvest this um, very carefully and sustainably. And the lovely thing about this is you've got to get wildflower meadows when we cut down the fern. Anyway, let's look at this. 
Um, so basically all these small furnaces can actually get a load of colour from their melts and that can be refined and sent to a larger company which will be producing luxury goods. By larger, I'm talking about smaller, uh, small medium type business with 150 kilo to, a, a, to maybe a ton pots or, or tanks where we can actually make things like chandeliers and you know uh, high value pieces, um, products. It can also go down to a third refinement. So if I add um, certain oxides, I can create a very optical, uh, high optical quality glass, which could then go to medium scale manufacturing or larger to make the solar concentrators. Or we could put boron in it, we could make it into Pyrex and we could start making products for the NHS, which would replace um, single use plastics in some cases and can go through an autoclave, go through a, a kind of a, a cleaning uh, process and withstand that, that heat. So we can actually change the properties of our glass um, and through this kind of extra refinement, um, produce um, a very low cost and low uh, emissions uh, glass product and material. I'm going to go to my website. This is just to remind me to go there now. Um, so I'm just going to escape out of this. <clears throat> I should point out, I was a glassmaker for 25 years. So to try and uh, become uh, a CAD expert did take a bit of time. Um, so I'm just going to go up to my brand new website. And I have to thank Jamie Kay for this. Um, he's actually just put this together. So nobody's really seen this um, before. Um, I'm not going to go through the team there because I've already showed you. There's a glass gallery. Please go on there and look at Richard Glass's work. It's absolutely fantastic. There's a bit about the circular economy, but we've already done, done that as well. I just want to go on to this one, which is artist collaborations. Because obviously I've got one foot in the glass works and one foot in the fab lab. Um, one foot in a process that hasn't changed for 2000 years and one foot in cutting edge technology. And this is the project I'm running at the moment with Emma Reynard, and we're looking into diatoms. We're doing some really nice work. Um, she's doing drawings. I'm producing pieces of glass. In response to those drawings, she makes more drawings, and we work together to develop a series of pieces. And this is Arts Council funded. We managed to get, or rather, Emma got the funding on behalf of both of us to be able to do this project. That's lovely. Um, also, this is the Flux film that I'd like you to watch if you've got time, because it is wonderful. Uh, and this is Abigail Reynolds. And she asked me if I could make a glass out of sand and seaweed. And lots of people have been asked. Nobody wanted to do it. I think I was the only one daft enough to try. Um, and we managed to make some wonderful glass um, from there. And then at the top here, this is Sam Herman. Uh, if anyone you know, uh, anyone knows Sam, he passed away last year. And Sam was instrumental in starting the studio glass movement uh, back in the 1960s. And he's the reason why I chose to work in glass. Um, main reason anyway, because he taught me back in the 80s. And I'm just going to show you this. This is one of his designs. He was actually into CAD design just towards the end of his, uh, before he passed away. And I just want to show you this. It's um, what we were working on together. There's a whole series of sculptures we're working. This is from the CAD drawing. Uh, and this is his, his idea. He, he drew it, basically, and I transport it into CAD. This is kind of the, the rendering you get from your CAD system. But then we take it to a high res. And this, of course, is still a CAD model, but I've put this through kind of uh, professional uh, rendering to see what it's going to look like before we actually make it. And of course, these models are CAD models, which I can 3D print. And of course, if I can 3D print it, I can cast it, because the print basically could be done in wax. Um, so it's, it's lost wax casting, basically. So that, to me, tells me that I can produce high quality renders. Now, Dr. Katie Shanks over at the university, this is the solar concentrator, by the way, the first one I designed. Um, what she's got is a load of software that can simulate light passing through it. So we don't have to make this yet. We can actually just take software and see how effective and how um, efficient this is going to be as a solar construct. Now, these things are going to be clipped together into large kind of uh, solar panels, 
which are going to be far more efficient than anything we, we have uh, naturally. The gaps in here, they're quite interesting. I'm going to go back into that in a minute. I'm just going to turn this off and see if I can come back to my presentation now. I think it's this one. Here we go. We're back. So that solar panel, uh, that uh, large kind of uh, panel there, I'm just going to go back to view. And I'm going to go to full screen mode. There we go. So the idea is this solar concentrator, modular blocks, will be put together. The, the use it in CAD, we, we can simulate it, but in the same way, I can make the, the presses and the tools to be able to make these things um, from that CAD model. Um, but we've got analysis software as well, so we can check that it's actually going to work before we go into production. And it's going to be made of modified, upcycled, end-of-life building glass. It's going to be clipped together um, with 3D printed structural parts. So at the end of its life, we can take it apart with no problem at all. Uh, and at the end of its working life, I'm going to formulate it so this will be perfect colours for our art glass, for our small businesses. And instead of paying £2,800, this stuff will become what we'll use in, um, in our studios. So I'm actually designing the product our solar concentrator will become. And that's what we need to be doing. Uh, and now I'm just coming to the end of the first part. And I want to actually mention the reason why Victoria is, is there. Um, and I'm not sure if Victoria realizes how important she is, but it's vital. Because all of this has come from a stumbling across the fact on, in a, I think it's a 17th century um, uh, manuscript or 16th century manuscript, um, that fern was used in Italy, in Pisa, actually to make really good quality glass. And at the same time, there was a discovery on Dartmoor of exactly that. These are little bits of glass that were found. I can see that's the top of a beer glass or a bottle, a, a, let's say a bottle there. You can see a little bit there where they kind of put the, the top in, the, the, the boom. But this is amazing. This is a folded rim from a foot. So whoever was working on Dartmoor was working in the most beautiful kind of manner. I don't know if you can make that out and all, but to me that is so exciting. These are little bits of glass being found on Dartmoor, proving that there was a glass studio there. And then, of course, you only have to look. This is um, from uh, um, C.M. Jackson, uh, University of Sheffield, and she's done a lot of work into the use of fern in history. And there's uh, Thomas More, 1557. Who would mean it possible e glasses were made of fur? And <laughs> again, back in the 12th century, um, they're even telling me when to pick it, when to actually uh, cut the fur. Fern is cut before the feast of St. John the Baptist, well dried and then put into the fire and reduced to ashes. Now, we've had quite a, a late summer, so I ended up cutting instead of July, I ended up cutting at the end of July, beginning of August. You can't do it in September because it becomes carcinogenic, apparently, if you leave it too long. But anyway, we know a lot about this. If we look back into history, we know how things were done. Um, this is the project I mentioned from the V&A, uh, where Sarah Fern, she's got a Sims machine. She can take a piece of glass and she can tell me and analyze exactly what's in it. So this was the goblet of the V&A that was corroding. And immediately she can see, and I can see, there's a major problem here. 70%, the SiO2 there, is sand or silica, let's say. The ash, the, the actual soda in a soda lime glass, is 20%. That's way over what it should be. So the Italians have always put loads more in than they should. And they get a fantastic, thin, workable glass, but at the expense of stability. Because there really should be about 12% calcium or lime. Uh, calcium oxide, you can find it in lime. So that should be much higher, but it's only 2%. So immediately we say, hang on a minute, there's not enough calcium there. So of course, the answer was to bathe the objects in calcium, in water and calcium, and that stabilized glass disease. And that's kind of the end of the first thing, but I just want to read one thing to you. And this is out of a book from 1661. And... I think it's wonderful what you find. It says here, and forgive me, it's not going to sound great, this, but um, after 18 hours, this stuff will be purified. 
which cast into water, purify it again in the furnace, make a proof, and if it be too clear, add 15 pound of aforesaid calcium tin, mix well the metal many times, and at the end of one day, it becomes marvellous white, and in whiteness surpasseth any snow, then work it. I've got to stop now because my alarm's going off, so I know I've gone well over there. So I'm just going to come out and stop presenting and um, ask if there's any questions at this point. Um, if you're still there, actually. Yeah, thanks, Ian. We're bang on time for this first part, so we can move on to the uh, Q&A session. So right, yeah. um, I'm going to invite uh, the participants to jump in if they have any questions or uh, if you feel like writing them in the chat, we'll pick them up. Ian, what's going to be the cost in all of this and how will you fund it? Um, well, that's an interesting thing. We've just done the crowdfunder oh. um, and we raised just over £10,000. And the furnace that I built back in 2012 um, cost me about 450 quid to build. Um, but the, the system that I run it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a package burner with high low fire. It's computer controlled. That's about two and a half grand's worth. And I have to say thank you so much for Safe Flame. Um, and this is Gary at Safe Flame. Uh, and, they actually gave me the first one free of charge. We bought the second one, of course. Yeah. Um, but th that support from him was just incredible. So I was, I was able to build my furnace uh, for very little, really. And I've still got, you know, parts, and I, I can buy the parts to be able to put this together. And I reckon around about 500 quid, I'll be able to build myself a furnace. But I do want to build it in, in stainless steel. And the great thing about Tim over at... Um, uh, the brewery that we're working with um, uh, is he's reusing uh, all the equipment, he's repurposing equipment. So I'm on the lookout for a large stainless steel vessel that I'll make my furnace out of. Um, so the costs, I'm thinking about £5,000 to get my building with a concrete floor, everything I need in there. And I've already got glass bits and bobs. Richard's actually going to put some stuff in there as well. We've got tools, we've got you know, I say the skeleton of a, of a furnace that we're going to put together. So I'm going to say I've got the first part that I'm going to put together around about 500 quid, uh, 5,000 pounds, sorry. I'll need another 5,000 for admin and for uh, consumables. Um, and then I'm looking for some serious funding uh, to be able to carry on. And that's in the second part of the talk, actually. Right, okay. Sorry. Just <laughs> another quick question. Yeah. Are you considering also kiln-fired glass? As I have used recycled glass in the kiln before. A lot of people are. Um, I haven't, to be honest, because I'm talking about tonnage here. I'm yeah. talking about molten glass that we could take out and sell yeah. as a product. So I'm going to go into a ton, uh, maybe even bigger, and right. automated systems where just glass will be spat out the end of it because there is no company in this country that's producing glass. Right. So you're not going to... You're not going to produce objects yourself. You're just going to produce the glass. You are going to produce objects. That's the first thing I'm going to do is produce. Um, in fact, I've got a few little kind of samples that I'm working on. I have a new, whole new range of work that I'm going to produce from January. So I'm going to sell my own objects um, to produce a bit of money. Uh, we're going to look at other ways of raising capital uh, and investment. And we're going to move towards uh, moving to these ideas of solar concentrators and larger products that will be more mass produced actually, which will generate a huge income, which will filter down and support the arts and history and heritage projects, hopefully. But kiln glass, I mean, we are gonna produce, um, you know, uh, the optical glass, which will be perfect for casting. It'll be much better than anything, um, uh, you know, a kind of leadless glass, if you know what I mean. Excellent, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. And I'm just looking at the chat as well. You've got a few comments there, Ian. So uh, you've got the Graph Glass team uh, who's saying that they are glass makers with an electric furnace and a co farm across the road. So if you need volunteers, um, they're there. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. And then um, Dot would like to uh, follow up on uh, helping you with the stainless 
uh, vessel. So I think there'll be a, a good conversation to pick up there. Oh, absolutely. You know, anything you can contact me, you know, uh, um, I'm, I'm really on the lookout for, I'm, I'm actually looking for an oval, like the old oval kiln, so I can put two pots in there. Cause I know I can take the pots up in two hours. Um, but I think if I have two, I can have a clear glass in one and a colored glass in the other. And that's where we can really do some wonderful stuff. And the other thing as well, of course, if we if we color our glass ourselves, we're coloring our base glass. We're not buying loads of different glass rods, uh, which may not be compatible with each other and with our base glass. If we make our own glass um, and we make our own color, and that could be a colored pot or it could be colored rods that we make one day. You know, we know that it's all from the same uh, homogenous uh, um, uh, melt. Great. So, um, do we have any other questions from uh, the audience? No? All right, we've got one from Mel. So, is China using these ancient glass making recipes? That's a good question. Is China using the ancient uh, glass making recipes? You know what? Loads of people are. Okay. Lot, I mean, lots of companies are, I'm sure. Um, the the glass that I produced using the seaweed, I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Can you see that? It's a kind of aqua glass. Um, and you can see everywhere as you go around, you get certain colors. You get a dark green, which will probably be a kind of a fern or a you know, different kind of uh, um, leafy type plants. Um, but the seaweed thing is, it's not the seaweed that creates the color. I think what that is, is the the, the tin and copper mining that goes on around Cornwall. Um, and it's what's in the sand. It's a contaminant in the sand that actually color it. The lovely thing is, we know how to decolor this using historical methods. I'd be very surprised if China weren't using knowledge based on, and we all do. Um, but what happened is around about 1800, kind of chemical um, uh, kind of alternatives came around, which are more financially um, viable, let's say. It was cheaper for them to do that than to actually go and harvest stuff. But now we've got a point where we're going too far with consumerism. I think it's about time we look back to our local, um, uh, our local environment. Yeah. In particular, what I love is what I want to do is make, um, I shouldn't have said this really, but I'm going to. Uh, in five years' time, I want to be making coral reefs because yeah. I can formulate the surface of the glass to actually match exactly what the coral needs so we can grow the spores on it. But we can make that coral out of sand and seaweed from the environment that, um, that we're going to place the coral alternative. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that, that's great. Yeah, I'm just going to invite uh, the Graph Glass team to jump in with their question. Please do. Hi, Ian. Um, I've signed in with the wrong email. It's Kaylee, not oh, Graf. Kaylee. <laughs> I can't see you. I've got this on. I'm going to try and escape out of this so I can see you. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, are you interested in having access to Okra's old uh, recipes? Yes. Because Okra used to melt everything themselves and make all their colours compatible and everything like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Any information would be gratefully received and shared, of course. Obviously, I'm still in touch with Richard and he's got all of he's got stacks of recipes that he's tried over the years and annotations and yeah. things I mean, like that. I, I would be nervous to ask someone like Richard because what you're looking at is years and years of dedication and hard work. I remember giving somebody, I won't tell you who, I remember giving somebody all of my notes on glass colour uh, back in the 90s when I was at the RCA and that person just walked away with them, never returned them and, and made <laughs> quite a name for themselves. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I would be grateful for any information. The idea well, of the upcycle glass. He's, he's very happy to share the information because he's retired now. So it's not like you're going to do his career any damage. You know what? We, we, <laughs> we do something with that. We should do some good with that. The whole point of my company is it's a CIC. It's a community interest company. Now my community is in Devon. It's in the region. Of, uh, of of Dartmoor and Plymouth, but it's also global. And this is why I want to learn, I'm going to mention community shares now rather than later. My company is going to start 
using community shares and hopefully some uh, we can attract some investment because the ideas are really good and we prove that they work um, but the idea of our community being both local and global is really exciting the um, the, the actual um, glass that we made with the sand and seaweed we got an award from the gas people over at the, you know, the Glass Art Society in the States. And the award was a one hour conversation with Tim Muff, who's an expert in running his workshop on methane from a dump. And we haven't stopped talking. In fact, we've agreed to have a, a collaboration between Tim, myself and Katie over at Minimelt. And what we want to do is convert everything to methane or to vegetable oil, used vegetable oil, but have the safety systems needed um, that I've got on my furnace on theirs so that they can put their products into schools and colleges. So everything is going to be shared and filtered down into the community um, for the benefit of the community. Sorry. That sounds I'm, awesome. I'm talking too much, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, Ian. So um, I'm just jumping on to another question and then we'll take a quick uh, break uh, before the second part. So can the seaweed glass uh, with that aqua color be used in lamp working to make uh, beads? Yes, but you're going to have to be careful. So what we would have to do if you wanted to use it for lamp working, I'd be really interested in adding boron to it because that's, of course, going to be borosilica glass. You can make your own borosilica glass. It's going to be more expensive because we have to go to higher temperatures uh, to be able to do it. But um, I'm going to say, yes, anything is possible. And that's the lovely thing about this. However, if you put boron in there, you've got a very aggressively corrosive glass, which is why the furnace I've created, you can take the pot out in half an hour and put another one in. So what we're going to have is rather like the Fab Lab here, we've got a... Um, a 3D printer over there that runs out of liquid resin. So you've got a tank of white, you've got a tank of black, a tank of clear resins, uh, this castable resins. So you basically change the tank for that material. What I want to do is have a load of pots and I just put the pot that's actually right for that particular um, glass type, if you know what I mean. That's great. Thanks, uh, Ian and Lisa. Perfect. So um, what we'll do now is uh, take a, a quick five minute break. Hope everyone's had a good break. Um, Give themselves a, a, a drink uh, to finish up with uh, the, the sort of second part of the talk. Um, Ian's going to be focusing on uh, his sort of background this time, telling us more uh, about that and also about his sort of vision for uh, sustainable businesses and uh, resilient communities. So, um, Ian, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, I'll just put that onto full screen there. Okay, so um, what you see on the left, that blackboard, was the thing that instilled fear in me when I was at school um, because I didn't realize I was dyslexic until much later on in life. And none of the tutors or teachers realized I was dyslexic. We just had thick kids uh, back there. And our school was a bit of a war zone, to be honest. And so nobody wondered why I was in remedial class for most of my school time. And yet I was still in one of the highest classes in physics. Nobody asked any questions, really. We were told when we were in our third year because we were so disruptive that we could go home um, we don't have to go to school and no one will chase us and then the teachers could actually carry on and teach the kids who weren't thick so i actually left school with no qualifications except for csc metalwork i went in for, for metalwork because i like that and again it's working with my hands uh, and on the right is me dad's car um, a lot of people get into maintenance through a hobby but we had to do this for a necessity because we didn't have the money to be able to get it fixed. So at 14 years old, uh, we took the bonnet off and I was stood on the wings with a rope around my neck, lifting the engine as best as I could while my dad actually replaced the engine mounting underneath. And my mum was absolutely disgusted that I had rope marks at the back of my neck. But he also 
taught me how to completely strip this motor down, this engine down, because we had to again. Um, and the cylinder head gasket is a really good thing to start with here because you have to tighten it up in a certain way. If you tighten it up wrong, your engine will kind of twist slightly and it will damage and the, the, the gasket will, will damage. So you have to do it in order, in a particular order. My dad knew exactly. He actually worked in Ford, actually. He knew exactly which order that should go. And then to tighten it up, you need a torque wrench. Most people would need a torque wrench. My dad didn't need that. He just knew what it felt like to be correct. So at one point, I'm not getting any education. And at another point, I'm getting the most amazing education in how things feel when you're doing things. Another thing we did, um, again, 15 years old, we put in a central heating system, my dad and I. And this is another point where if you've got a joint like the one at the top, it's a, it's a compression point, a joint. Uh, not quite as um, uh, common now, but very, very common back in the 80s or late 70s, I should say. And you tighten up the, uh, the nut against the thread, and there's an olive in there. The olive basically compresses and causes the seal. Now, if you don't tighten it up enough, it's going to leak. If you tighten it too much, it's going to leak. So how do you know? Uh, you know through experience, through tightening that up, and you just feel it. Same thing with the torque wrench, same as working on an engine. And we did that. And so a lad with no qualifications, except for the CSE metalwork, um, got to the point where he was offered three apprenticeships. I had my choice of one at Pilkerton Glass, one at the Coal Board, and one at the BICC uh, in Prescott, which is a large cables company at the time. And I chose Pilks, because I'm so glad I did. Um, and what you see on the right-hand side is a factory. At one end of this factory is a furnace, and all the raw materials go into the furnace, and it floats on a bed of tin, used to be mercury in the first day, that was very dangerous, but a bed of tin, and it comes out at the other end as flat glass, sheets of flat glass, and that's cut automated, the whole thing's automated. And that's where I did my apprenticeship. And the reason I got those three offers of work is because back then when you went for an interview, they'd give you an aptitude test. And that aptitude test was about uh, practical, um, problem solving. And I remember one of them, the guy said, right, you, you're in this gear on, on your bike. You've got the big one, you're in that one, and the small one, you're on the middle one. What gear are you in? And I said, that's not fair. I've got gears on my bike. And that, literally, that's how naive I was. But I passed every single one. Um, and they said, if you we give you a place, will you do your O levels? And I said, yes, of course I will. And I never did. Um, I did them later on, of course, because I needed to, much later in life. But there you have it. I got myself a job and I started work at Pilkerton Glass. Uh, my education, as you can see right at the bottom there, was nothing really from school. But you can see while I was at Pilks, I did my city and gills. I did my advanced craft city and gills and gas and oil supplies. I've got an EITB certificate of engineering for craftsmanship, maintenance and il illustration. It, il I'll start again. Installation and maintenance of factory services at Pilkerton Glass. Can you imagine that? I mean, that is one heck of a furnace. If you can build or you know, work on one of those, you can work on anything. Um, so I'm very, very lucky to have that kind of experience. I went to art college eventually. And of course, I did my CSEs there, GCSE, sorry, art and design, ceramics, photography, so on. Went off to book college, did my degree, ended up at the Royal College of Art, did my, my uh, master's there, got a commendation, and then went on to the London Institute and was awarded a distinction in my written work and my research into the acquisition, the application, and the relevance of skill. And you can see why I did that. Because the whole point of acquiring skill and the whole way that I acquired skill was completely different to the way most people would acquire an education and skills very reflective, very how it feels to how it can be proved. Um, these are some of the things I made over at TVG. And that simple basic idea turned a company that was, and I'm sure they won't mind me saying, but when I took them over, they were making 60,000 pounds a quarter loss. And within the first quarter, we started making a profit. 
Um, and because of simple things like these marble wine glasses in the middle, they had two colors and they had some earth twist ones as well. The colors were blue and green and red and blue. And they were shipping them out to America and the company, basically all the, the galleries and shops wouldn't order anymore because we could never supply enough glasses because you get one bubble and it's a second. So there were never enough to make the set to be able to send them out. So my thought was, well, don't then. Let's just have a different color. Just make random colors, loads of them. So the set could be picked up from a, a larger amount of glasses, let's say. And that's the kind of thinking, the really simple thinking that turned things around very, very quickly. And this is my first range, which was the paperweight. They had a paperweight insert and I loved it so much. I stuck it in the top, of, well, it's put it on a plinth. So I made this decanter. Um, and we actually beat Dartington Crystal to um, uh, a Gift of the Year award, an international award, uh, design award, which I'm very, very proud of back then. So these are the awards. I'm not going to go into it, but you've got Pod, um, which is one of them. And that's quite an interesting one because I put a, a metal surface on the surface of the glass. Um, and the thing was that the metal, you can see it there at the bottom in the center there, that one of the products that TVG had was really good seller and had diproic glass. But somebody in the old days had never really actually costed the cost of that dichroic. And what I worked out was they actually lost a pound every time they sold one. So they were selling and selling and selling and they were losing more and more money. So that one thing, that one thing that I noticed actually stopped most of the losses. And what I did is TVG were making paperweights. They had seven people, sorry, no, they had seven people in total, but around about four people would be making the paperweights at one time and they'd make seven an hour. So seven an hour with four people. These pods, these little sculptures with a little stopper that comes in and out, one person can make 15 an hour. And the, the surface is an oxide um, and it costs pennies. So you can see all of a sudden we're doing some really quick um, sculptural work, uh, moving away from a trade, the gift trade, and moving into contemporary craft, which is what contemporary art, which is what I wanted to do. So this is my employment, <laughs> starting off as a, a craft apprentice, a craft engineer, I think. Um, I like to say. Um, and then I, I worked at the RCA for uh, seven years. I, I was the um, glass maker there. I'd also worked for Habitat as a designer. But what I put in bold there is um, I was actually asked to, to come and be a lecturer in professional practices and work-based learning because of the success I had at TVG and turning it around at a time that all the glass companies, the bigger ones, were actually failing and, and closing. Um, and also, I, I was also a researcher in sustainability um, because I was thinking about furnace ideas and all that kind of stuff. And you can see that went on till about 2012, 2014, it all stops. And I became the manager of Fab Lab Plymouth. Um, and at that point, I knew enough about the reflective side of making and how we make things and how we acquire skill. I knew nothing about the technical side of things. So I needed to be able to, because I've, I've published work on, on this application of skill, I should really know a little bit about the technical side. So I got into 3D printing, I got into all that kind of digital stuff. Uh, and there's me again, having fun. You can see this is history. This is history with the Hawkwind t-shirt there. Um, and this is the research again. You can see I started after working with Sarah at Imperial College. In 2003, I started publishing work. Uh, and that goes through to making futures to uh, the uh, VNA, Ways of Making and Knowing, Material Culture of Empirical, Empirical Knowledge. That was a really, really nice one, actually, and quite a prestigious one. Uh, you can see Cambridge University crops up a few times there. Um, recipes, um, I can't even pronounce it, it's the model. that wasn't my, um, uh, my title. I, I actually titled it Making Old Glass, I think. Um, but you can see that there's an awful lot of stuff there, which again stops dead around about 2012, where I stopped being an academic and started to be more of a, a technician in the true sense of the word, I think. And all my, um, I've got lots of publications. I did the kind of publish quite a lot of work and it's already been peer reviewed. So I'm not gonna go into this now. I really do apologize, but we haven't got time. There could be a completely different talk about the whole idea of my mode of thinking 
is reflective up until 2012. Everybody's mode of thinking really in terms of society tends to be technical, technical rationality. The main difference between this, it sounds a bit kind of complex, but the main difference is before the industrial revolution, um, art and science was the same thing. The glass maker was the same person that melted the glass, mixed the glass, blew the glass and sold the glass. Um, they were like princes, basically. Uh, but they used reflective rationality, which is a suck it and see. Try it on the factory floor. When we start making lots of stuff, lots and lots of things, we find that our mode of thinking changes because we have to write things down. It becomes more technical. Then we have to start having job specifications. And we can only do what's on our job list. Um, but nurses can't actually act for themselves because they have to go from a chart and tick things off. Things become more, so much com more complicated now that we're in this political administ administrative, administrative and political system where decisions are made at the top and filtered down to the bottom. And the people at the bottom are the people who have the uh, understanding of how things work, but no kind of input into the decision making above. So what I'm saying is a mode of thinking is not just our thoughts. It's the framework that we put our thoughts on. It's the framework within which we think. It's the reason why we know we're heading to destruction, but we can't stop because technical rationality and the birth of technical rationality is so entwined with the birth of consumerism that we can't actually rip it apart. We can't stop being consumers. We can't stop consuming the planet's resources. And again, I'm not going to go into this and try and prove it because it has already been peer reviewed. Um, so very quickly, um, before the Industrial Revolution, you've got reflective rationality. Um, and the industry was a cottage industry. Now, the idea of that, it's, it's rural and it's a subsistence economy. So you basically, labor was just about providing food, clothing and shelter for ourselves rather than to a market. After the Industrial Revolution, things become very complicated. We're using technical rationality as a different mode of thinking. It's like our behavior changes. Um, and it's a factory industry. It's urban based mostly. Uh, and it's also intertwined with the birth of consumerism. And labor now is performed in excess of the labor necessary to produce that kind of, you know, the food and shelter and stuff. But it's actually on behalf of the factory and of the market which actually is becoming more and more complex and bigger and bigger as, as we go on. What I'm suggesting is a different, a completely different mode of thinking. We're a combination of both reflective and technical rationalities, understanding that there's merit in both. The type of industry should be regional. The type of economy should be leaning towards that subsistence, subsistence economy but a community-linked reflective consumerism. That's where businesses are working together and not just like-minded people. At the moment, we've got this fantastic place in Totnes and you've got this idea where you've got a barter system and you could get your aura cleansed, but you'll never get somebody to fix your boiler, if you know what I mean, because there's not enough kind of movement between this reflective rationality and our reflective thinking and the way that we work and think and the technical side of things, which is big business and so on. Anyway, type of labor. Now, I want labor to be formed in excess of what we need in terms of uh, food, drink, and so on, as uh, food and uh, a roof over our heads and so on, on behalf of the regional community and the environment. And that can replicate it up and down the country, nationally and globally. And so what I've got here is this idea that glass blowing is 2000 years old. It hasn't changed. You work by feel. This is why I, I was a glassblower for 25 years, why I absolutely love sitting in that bench. You can't get a smile off my face, um, even with the sciatica. <laughs> but it's all about risk. It's all about tacit skill. It's all about how it feels. And what I'm proposing is that there is a spectrum of rationality. Technical rationality hasn't completely replaced reflective rationality. People do still feel as if they reflect uh, in not just reflecting within our mode of thinking, but our mode of thinking itself is reflective. And then you've got the other side of things, which is purely technical. And you've got the fab lab, which is the workmanship of certainty, where we actually, uh, <laughs> where we actually type risk out of the making. 
take the hand and the heart out of the making. And it can be so dull. It can be so harsh and soulless. And what I'm proposing is that we should be free to find what quality is. And if we want to get quality, we can't just sit like blowing bubbles in glass. And we can't sit in the fab lab making cool stuff that actually is as 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 soul destroying as a neon light. You know, we need to be able to travel from one end to the other of this reflective and technical rationality. Um, I'm not going to go any more about this because my wife tells me don't talk about that because they'll all switch off. So I'm going to move on. So who benefits um, from Upcycle Glass Company? Well, instead of investors and shareholders. I want our planet and our community to benefit, our environment to benefit. And the initial investment, we've already raised the 10 grand through Crowdfunder, um, through like-minded people. Um, normally, a company, you see it on Dragon's Den, don't you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you 50 grand, but I want half your company. And what do we do with that? They'll sell it eventually. Because we've stopped selling stuff. We're now buying and selling the companies that make stuff. We're the point and we've got nothing left to, to make and sell because it's our our kind of um, uh, consumerism of uh, the consumerism kind of uh, structure has got too big, and we're looking for more ways of making money. I want community shares and grants to be the initial investment, but I want the idea to be so good that we start making money. I want to be able to prove that businesses working together could make serious profits, but those serious profits go straight back into the community, straight back into the pockets of the people, straight back into the environment and straight back into our planet. Um, and how much do directors and shareholders earn? There's no cap on pay normally. Directors take bonuses and shareholders take dividends. And the, the idea is, of course, um, that they don't take too much, but we all know they do. So I want wages capped at national average for me and for anyone who works within Upcycle Glass Company. Um, and basically the shareholders, when they buy community shares, they can take their money out at any time, but they can't make money by buying and selling it. Um, and what happens to the profits? So in standard business, profits go to investors and shareholders, and the rest is supposed to be growing the business. And we all know how well that's going. Um, with the idea I have, with the structure I have, all profits go to the community. Now, don't forget, we grow the business, support with new start startups and so on, but I want the business to be making large-scale solar concentrators, large-scale products, and I want the money from that to filter down to actually support the arts and support the history and heritage projects. Because nobody else is going to do it. It's only going to get worse in terms of the government, in terms of finding money to support the art. I think we have to find a way to, to find a sector, develop a sector which will actually support the arts um, as part of its remit. And here's my conclusion. I'm sorry, I'm just going to read this out. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, we've moved ever further away from using reflective rationality as our preferred mode of thinking. If we continue to use technical rationalities as the only framework to hang and frame our intellectual thinking and decision making, we are lost. We will be unable to reverse the direction we are heading in towards the destruction of our climate. I'll give you an example um, of technical rationality. Smart motorways. Um, smart motorways, the idea is that if you're in your car, we can do away with the hard shoulder we can have everyone driving on all of the things and you've seen them haven't you and um if you break down don't worry about it because you just stay in your car put your seatbelt on and someone will come out and pick you up and then the smartness is that the system will say this lane is closed there is a vehicle obstructing this lane and people are getting killed because you'll be sat there waiting for a pickup truck driver to come and tow you away and none of them will because they know how stupid that idea is how dangerous that is to go onto a motorway and try and pick some up in the middle of a motorway. Because what they don't think about is that every time I drive to Liverpool, I find at least four or five complete idiots driving far too fast and swapping lanes. 
trucks, lorries cannot stop quickly. And if it's a lorry either side of them, there's no way they're going to be able to stop before they hit that car. So it's just one small example of the way that our society is trapped in this mode of thinking. Um, if we don't start thinking about different frameworks, we're going to be completely lost because every time they say, okay, we're going to let uh, business and technology save us, that's only going to make us run faster towards oblivion. Um, so if we recognize, if we recognize that our society has been divided and polarized, not by our thoughts, but by a mode of thinking, the framework on which we hang our thoughts on, we might be able to recognize the value of both as individuals and as a society. And it'll allow us to travel along that spectrum of rationality, seeking quality and harmony in everything we do and realizing our full potential as human beings. And it will create an opportunity to create new solutions and new sustainable business models, far more practical and workable and efficient for the use of our complete intellectual capacity. And that's a nice picture of the unintended consequence of my venture. Because if you think about a lot of the technical solutions to climate change, there's a kind of unintended thing that is actually just as bad for the environment. Um, and when, the, when Andrew told me that when we cut down the, the fern, we're not going to cut so much down, we're going to change the nature of Dartmoor. We're only going to cut down what we need so we've got another crop for next year. We're going to get wildfire meadows. And that, to me, is the most wonderful kind of point, I think, to end on. I think that's me, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ian. And you've got such an interesting uh, journey, interesting path that laid, led you to uh, to that project and, and really uh, interesting observations about the sort of reflective uh, and technical sort of rationality as well. Uh, so I'm going to invite um, the audience to ask any sort of final questions potentially. Uh, if, if you have any, jump in or write them in, in the text. Again, thank you to, to Ian for putting that uh, presentation together. Um, it was it was great. So uh, let me have a look at the chats. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, we've got a question from Mel. So we've already lost so much intuition, sensitivity, imperial learning, etc., etc. We've missed the points. Uh, lost through fed education is one way. <clears throat> Hands on feeling through a wide education is essential. Please keep in contact um, once you more. Also need a connection with return to sensitive farming. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm very interested um, because I, I actually wrote the first external course for PCA. Um, it was a creative apprenticeship. I really want to write an apprenticeship for Glass um, where it's about making, but it's also about making the material, harvesting sustainably the material nearby, and actually the apprentices traveling to all the glass department, all the glass workshops in that region. Um, because the problem is that the glass glass workshops can't find apprentices that are going to stay um, but if we actually gear up and we have a, a proper uh, you know some, something that, that they could go to Katie over in Bristol they could go to TVG they could go to Bob Crooks they could go to um, Cornwall they could go all sorts of places around that kind of region you know and gain so much experience at the same time the kind of thing that Pilks gave me was actually a concept of quality um, and the, the the thing that really got me kind of understanding that what quality is, is the nature, the changing nature of um, of what they say quality is. I, I know it sounds weird, but the first job I did is to put a, a radiator in the boss's, um, boss's office. And it took me all day to do it. But it, you could put a spirit level on it. It looked absolutely fantastic. The boss said, well done, lad. The second job was on that massive factory. There was a leak going down into the glass. So they put me on one of those cranes, you know, the little box things, and they put me up there and I fixed it really quick and I came back and it looked terrible. The pipes were like that, really bent and it looked dreadful. But they said, well done, lad, that was really good. You did that in no time at all. So speed becomes the most important thing. It, 
that kind of training, that kind of understanding of what quality is and how that can change depending on the job in hand, the reflective kind of um, attitude within um, uh, empirical training, empirical knowledge, whatever, um, is vital. We need to kind of inject that into it, into everything we do, I think. Sorry, I'm, I'm babbling. No, absolutely, Ian. So, um, yeah, we've got so many positive comments for you. So if you want to have a read on the chat, um, I think, yeah, the feedback is uh, that it's been really inspiring for everybody. And uh, thank you for your enthusiasm as well. Um, so, yeah, fantastic. Cool. And everyone is, is going to be looking for it in the progress uh, for the upcycle glass project, definitely. <laughs> Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course, if you go ahead. Um, I think your idea, Ian, of the cottage industry, cottage industry is, you know, a brilliant sort of way of thinking about how the future could unfold. And I think it really relates to the idea, the underlying principles of the Fab Lab and the Fab City initiative, where it's all about global knowledge sharing, but then having, um, you know, local production bases and working together mm. with the circular economy. And I was just thinking if, you know, people around the world would see your, your company and be inspired to set up a similar one of their own, but perhaps don't have access to the fern you use, but, you know, because they're from a different country, a different climate, would um, it be possible to kind of use different local resources to get a similar result to what you're doing? Absolutely. There's lots and lots of historical um, uh, information. Over in America, they use spruce pine, for instance. Okay. Um, that's a standard kind of thing. So there's all sorts of things that we can use. And I do hope that we'll do, I mean, the problem is I want to run a business and I want to make money so that I can generate enough to put back into that business. Mm -hmm. But it is about research and development really, really. And I have to say the most important thing is that on my R&D team is a scientist, is a optical expert, uh, a, an analysis, surface analysis expert and a historian because those kind of uh, the information we find from history and from what people have done in the past and for um, uh, was it orca glass, all of that is essential to keep alive and to kind of bring back. But to mix with cutting edge technologies and thinking it, it's that kind of appreciation of both. Uh, we, we could have, I don't know, seven or eight different recipes using different materials. Seaweed is obviously one near the coast. Uh, again, it would have to be harvested sustainably uh, or grown, perhaps. Um, I would love to find out what happens to the brewery at the end of the, the yeast and all of that kind of stuff. If we burn that, what do we get? You know, there's all sorts of experiments to do. But I think looking in history, you'll find that everywhere you are, there will be a material that we can use, but we have to be very, very careful. It's a bit like biofuels we cut down trees to make our biofuel. So we have to find ways of actually using those as uh, parts of another business. If you know everything's passed on, all the materials is kind of used up, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And a uh, good point, Sophie, to link that up with Fab City as well, because I think there is a strong link there as well. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well, I think, um, if there is no other question, we're just going to wrap up uh, with the talk. Uh, I can see more uh, comments again. Uh, just a final question from Jenny. Uh, do you think your products are likely to be more functional in terms of justifying resource use? It's a very good question. Um, in terms of justifying resource use, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, that Functional, yes. I'm, do you know what? It's interesting because there are certain things that I love doing at the RCA, and I, I don't want to show you my work or stuff, but it's very clean lines, just clear glass, but perfect forms. They're not really sustainable, financially sustainable, because you have to throw a lot of color and decoration and everything to be different to the factories. I think basically we can go back to simple functionality because we're bringing the cost of running our furnace right the way down. And if that's the case, we can charge less for it and the public will probably buy, um, you know, more functional objects. And that's what I really hope in my heart, because I want to sit there and make some beautiful, simple little objects 
um, that are very, very well made. And I want people to appreciate that as well. Rather like we move towards organic food, I want people to appreciate organic glass. And if there's a couple of bubbles in there, well, tough because we're saving the environment. You know, <laughs> That's what I would absolutely love. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, Jenny, feel free to jump in, but there might be a link with like sort of long-term objects that you'd be making as well, which would justify that uh, use of resource. Yeah. Yeah, learn to love the bubbles. <laughs> we used to say, as it half a joking, that every bubble is a glass maker's tear, but the gallery still rejected it. And this is what we have to kind of get across here, that rather like having to clean your your vegetables i was appalled when i first got a kind of batch of vegetables with mud on it what the heck? and then you realize i've got a minute this is a good thing it's the same thing we need to change the way we think we need to change the way we work together um, we need to change certainly the way that business is working because it's not helping it's doing the opposite and if that business is about environments what it's going to do is sabotage any chance of that idea actually bearing fruit for the environment itself because it's got to bear fruit for the investors it's got to because that's the way our mode of thinking now works it's almost like humanity has a self-destructive behavioral disorder and hasn't really noticed the way that we think naturally has changed since the industrial revolution we need to kind of come back a little bit get a grip mm -hmm. and actually uh, do something about the situation we're in rather than talk about it in cop 26 and then jump on a jet plane and go back for lunch yeah Absolutely. That's, um, that's why your, your, your project is, is so inspiring as well. So, um, yeah, thanks again, uh, Ian. I think we're going to be wrapping it up uh, here. So uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for, for joining us. Uh, I hope uh, you've found uh, the talk really uh, sort of informative, inspiring. Uh, that was the, the whole point of it. And if you need uh, more uh, details, if you want to link up and work with Ian, uh, feel free. Uh, I think he's open to sort of collaboration as well as the project is sort of starting. And um, in addition to that, uh, I just want to highlight our next uh, sustainable design uh, talk, uh, which is going to be happening on the 9th of December, and we'll be joined by a marine biologist from Hong Kong University uh, to tell us about coral reef restoration using 3D printing and eco material and how this type of project could support uh, Plymouth marine biodiversity. So that should be a very interesting one. I think Ian, you'll probably want to join that as well, uh, given the comments you made earlier. And uh, yeah. Uh, really uh, looking forward to that. So uh, thanks everyone again and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.